I'm Alex Martins. I'm the VP of Strategy here at Catalog. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Ben Johnson-Ward. Ben, you want to say hi? Hey, guys. I'm Ben Johnson-Ward. I'm the VP of Solution Engineering here at Curiosity Software. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. And uh, Ben and I know each other for many years now. Um, and uh, we're really excited to share with you this new approach of, um, of uh, software quality. So really introducing uh, the uh, a comprehensive, holistic view of quality into the software development lifecycle, which includes requirements as well as uh, user-based approaches. So with that, let me jump into the agenda here. We'll talk about the gap in traditional testing strategies, uh, just something uh, both of us have uh, noticed as we help our customers uh, enhance their testing processes. Uh, what does a modern testing strategy look like based on what we've been learning and, and, and helping those companies? Then we'll jump right into a demo where Ben is going to show us how we can really uh, excel and improve uh, requirements-based requirements -based testing. Um, and then we'll uh, talk about uh, end users. So do we really test the applications the way our users actually use them? Um, and, and then I'm sure there's going to be some revelations there. And then I'll do a demo of uh, how to validate that the user experience, you know, that the, the user perspective uh, doesn't break uh, with every new release. How do we introduce that user-based uh, approach into the testing strategy as well? Okay. As you have questions throughout the, the session, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, towards the end, we're going to uh, try to address them. Um, uh, and, uh, and obviously, the ones that we can't get to we will address them offline for you. All right. So let me see. I'm going to end the poll now and see if I can show the results somehow. Okay. Share results. There we go. All right. Uh, I believe you are seeing it. Don't see my screen, but I believe you're seeing. Um, so which factors are responsible for bugs in your organization's production systems? Um, and uh, we have a pretty good a division here uh, where uh, poorly defined requirements with 43%, errors in development 46%, uh, incomplete and suboptimal, uh, suboptimal testing 34%, lack of feedback from production 16 and all of the above. Obviously, uh, we expected a little bit of everything, but it's interesting to see the distribution here. So this is great because it helps us guide the, the conversation today and as well as the demos. So. Thank you for participating, everyone. All right, cool. So let's jump into the main topic. So uh, one thing we like to contextualize everybody, I'm sure uh, uh, most of you have heard that uh, you know testing is one of the biggest bottlenecks in the software development process. Um, the GitLab Mobile DevOps Survey uh, specifically calls that out uh, when they look at the entire DevOps uh, practices. And the way we like to represent that is, you know, with that little bottleneck there from a, a, of the testing uh, of the of testing across the SDLC. And if we dive deeper into that, I mean, there there are valid reasons as to why that that phenomena happens. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of uh, activities that happen from a testing perspective that have to happen really quick so that uh, it doesn't slow down. The release process and uh, starting from reviewing requirements, understanding what those stories uh, are are meant to do uh, in the application, uh, creating tasks to validate those requirements, running those tasks, and then reviewing the results of those tasks, and then thinking about what are the tasks that can or should be automated because they're going to be have uh, they're going to have to be run um, uh, repeatedly throughout the release or throughout even the inside the sprints in the release. Then you have to run those tasks and then review those results. And usually that's where you have some uh, failures in the test execution, in the automated test execution that are not necessarily failures uh, with the application or defects in the application. Uh, sometimes they are uh, failures with the test scripts themselves, with the automated tests themselves. So being able to do all of these activities and more, right? This is just a quick summary. Um, and do that throughout the SDLC uh, continuously is very challenging. There's a lot of music, moving pieces, and it's not always uh, uh, fast, right? So 
uh, with that context, we wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about this new paradigm that's uh, that's coming up because testing uh, or, or guiding our tests uh, from the requirements perspective is something that we've been doing for you know decades now. And, uh, and it, ha- it has to continue, <clears throat> excuse me, it has to continue. But also one thing that, that we're finding out very quickly now, especially in the last few years, is that uh, from a requirements testing perspective, uh, you know, we've done all the tasks before release and, you know, it's good to go. But when we see the users actually, you know, doing those activities and the, fe- the new features that have been released, uh, very quickly, we're finding that the way they are using those features is not exactly how our business has envisioned those features to be used, and and that generates obviously uh, problems and production incidents, uh, issues that uh, could have been avoided if we try to understand how people are actually uh, navigating through the application. And that's where user user based testing comes into play, where we have the ability now. The technology allows us to understand how users are behaving in the production application. So, how are they um, going through the different workflows that have been enabled by different features that have been released? Um, you know, recently, uh, are they? following the, 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 the specific path that those new requirements are laid out from a business perspective. Um, and then we're able to use technology to visualize those user journeys. And very quickly when we do that, we learn that users are actually straying from the design paths and the requirements, right? And that's a powerful learning that um, you know a lot of companies are using. Uh, to retrofit the requirements and really augment those requirements to make sure that in the next release, uh, uh, not only we're testing the functionality or performance or security, but we're testing how users actually use the application. So the requirements are being enriched with the user-based perspective. And then from those user journeys, technology today allows us to automatically generate new tests. Um, th- so that we can make sure that in the next release, those uh, user journeys uh, in production that are working today and are not expected to change with the new requirement, that they continue working before we release, uh, before we push the new release to production. And then that enables, <laughs> excuse me, uh, it enables us to understand uh, the test coverage from a user perspective. How much is our testing lifecycle? covering from what the users are actually doing in production that's a powerful uh that's powerful knowledge that we can use and should use to make sure that we assess our release quality and then understanding that uh tests have been automatically generated to ensure those user journeys continue work to work understanding how much coverage it's being achieved in the, te- the testing life cycle in pre-production and then being able to run those tests in an automated fashion as part of your normal release cycle is something that technology is finally enabling us to do in a seamless way. So that's the, the new paradigm that's emerging and, and we're seeing a lot of our customers uh, 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 trying to unlock that new uh, that new approach in their organizations. And from a, if we put that uh, back into the requirement requirements-based testing mindset, um, you know, plotting that same uh, uh, graph from the beginning, we can obviously understand that, uh, hey, everything starts from requirements uh, till we understand what are the new features supposed to be doing. We test those new features. We have to have data, obviously, to gener- uh, to, uh, to be able to run those tests. Uh, we should be trying to automate uh, the tests that make sense to be automated that are, you know, that are uh, feasible. Um, run those tests in an automated fashion and then using those automated tests to do some type of smoke testing or you know automated regression testing i mean each organization is different the point here is uh approaching testing in the life cycle uh, for a requirements based testing uh, is a lot of work there's a lot of different moving pieces that uh unfortunately are not always fully automated and, uh, and we're going to talk about that. Ben is going to talk about that, how we can uh, optimize that process today. 
and how AI today can assist us, excuse me, how AI can assist us in making that process a lot easier, a lot faster, a lot with a lot less effort. So we'll, we'll touch on that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have um, the user-based testings, which starts by understanding how users uh, really interact with the application, how they navigate those different flows and, and user journeys. Um, and that starts by capturing those user sessions. What are they exactly doing? Visualizing what they're doing in, in different uh, user flows or different user journeys. Visualize that in a user journey map, for example. From those uh, journeys, automatically generate automated tests that can be executed as part of your normal automated test execution in pre-production. Excuse me. Um, can be uh, put into your smoke testing suites, regression testing suites. Visualize the coverage coverage that now you're being able to achieve as part of your uh, augmented set of tests. And then keep observing the user actions in production. Have the users change the way they behave, the way they navigate um, your application in production. We have a new release that has introduced new features or changes in existing features. Are the users behaving the same way or are they exercising existing workflows in different ways? So learning all that, uh, understanding all that will help both the requirements-based testing to be richer, as I mentioned earlier, but also it will help us maintain those automated tasks that have been automatically generated based on how users navigate. So that enables you to have an operational, let's say, regression testing suite based on how users uh, use the application all the time without having to put in any effort to keep uh, those, uh, those automated regression suites um, up to date. So if we put those two paradigms together, right, the, the requirements-based and user-based testing, uh, you can see that there are many activities across the entire software development lifecycle that, uh, that, that need to happen in order for you to put together a, a comprehensive testing strategy that covers both ends of the spectrum here. And, uh, and that's what we're going to show you today and, and start the conversation there. Okay. So with that, um, the, uh, Ben, enough, uh, enough slides here. I will stop sharing my yeah. screen and, uh, let you take it away. All right. Brilliant. And you can, you can, um, really, you know, take from what Alex has said. And if you think about the shift left and the shift right of this. The shift right, where you're actually testing what users are actually doing, is entirely complemented from the shift left of, before I even get to users, can I test what they could be doing? Now, users won't always do what we think they could do when we get to it, so we still have to do that. But if we start at that shift left of, what could they be doing, and using it to guide our testing, and also using it to be more precise in our quality and in our requirements, it can give us some advantages in terms of being automated before maybe even the tool is built, taking more of a TDD approach, but also actually potentially even building the right thing. So I'm gonna share my screen and what I'm gonna take you through is a little bit about modeling in general and requirements-based modeling and model-based quality. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna accelerate that with AI. So I go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you guys can see okay. And I'll just share my whole screen. Here I have a model, and in this case, the model is a flowchart. And my model is a representation of requirements that I might have, a website that I have to test, some logic, a process, it could be an API call, it could be anything. But rather than say having a written requirement, which we're gonna look at a little bit later, for example, about whether somebody can rent a car for an online service, and this could be a JIRA or a Word document or something like that. Rather than having a written requirement, the approach when we do modeling, when we do requirements-based testing or model-based quality, is to use models as an unambiguous way of being very precise with our requirements and therefore being very precise in our quality. Not just are we testing the right thing, but are we building the right thing and do we agree on what the right thing is? So here I have a requirement about whether somebody should be able to pick up certain cars and return in different locations and so on and so forth. But I could just as easily have a requirement about the process of logging in. 
So if we go and take a look at my model here, these models, and you could just view them as flowchart. This is quality modeler. There are other approaches to modeling that you can also take. Models like this basically represent the different things that could happen and the different things that could vary. So one example might be, okay, I could enter a valid username or a valid password or invalid, and I may or may not be successful in my login based on that, and I should have some different results, and maybe they attempt to do another login. It could be more complicated where I'm doing some end-to-end -end process where I'm logging into some Salesforce application, potentially I'm creating a lead in an API, and here, the nice thing about models is they can scale, so I can have subcomponents and things like that. The key idea with a model like this is that I can go and show this to my product owner. I can go and collaborate on this literally on a whiteboard, which is something people already do. I confirm this is precisely how this is supposed to work. Whether it is a complicated thing about the exact rules of whether somebody should qualify for a mortgage or whether it's a low level thing um, about, sorry, a rather high level thing about, you know, the, the end to end process of, you know, how we actually go and create new users. The upside of modeling like this traditionally has been that if I do construct a model, I can perform analyses on it. So this is not a static flowchart I've written on the whiteboard. Different pathways through here represent different ways we could go through this logic. So that could be different ways I call an API call, different ways I create a user, or different ways I log in or not, and different things that could vary, and therefore different potential test cases. So tools like this, approaches like this, can typically go and take a model like this and actually go and automatically generate the different possibilities, the different test cases, which I can go and review with a product owner, a product manager. And as we'll see later on, I don't just have to say generate the absolute every possible test case. I can generate optimal sets and so on and so forth. I can be smart, risk-based with my coverage. And I can actually go and say for each possibility through here, do I have a test case for that? I can go and export it and create automated tests from it automatically and things like that. For any sort of test cases you generate these ways, if you have a model which represents these are the things that could vary, you have a different way of measuring coverage. So a little bit later, one way of measuring coverage is what do users actually do? Or you could look at it in terms of code. How much of the code do we execute? Requirements-based coverage, or what I'm showing you what here in a second, is of all of the combinations of things that we think can vary in our initial requirement or cause and effect, how many of those combinations are recovering? So for any sort of test cases that I generate here, whether it's every possible test case or a more optimal set, I can actually go and measure their coverage directly. So I can see which parts of my diagram have test cases for it, or which combinations of items on my diagram have test cases for it. So this has been the traditional way that we have used models to make our coverage and our testing a more precise based on you know what we expect the requirement to actually be and be more open to inspection. I can show this to a product owner or product manager and say, are we on the same page as to how this is supposed to work? The traditional downside to this kind of approach though has been, I do have to come up with this model. So that normally means importing a Swagger specification or building this model by hand from scratch. But what we can do these days is we can actually be AI assisted with this. So if we, for example, take an existing requirement, like the one that I have here, so a customer wants to rent from an online service, they enter the pickup and the return locations, they select return dates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can actually go and give this to an AI to help me build out a model like this. And when we've built it out, and I'll show you that in just a second, I'll be able to get the automated testing, the data, et cetera. So let's go and do that now. So I come to my blank model here, and we have a co-pilot. And there's lots of things I can do in my co-pilot. I can have it summarize models, edit models, improve models. One of the things I can have it do is say, create me a model for the following requirement. Hopefully that's big enough for you guys to read. And I could bring in a JIRA, that kind of thing here. So if I'm given this by a product manager and saying, you know, I really need to distill this and have it written precisely. Remember, half of all defects or 43% according to our survey earlier come from misstated or poor requirements. One of the ways of making product people understand that 
is actually to visually display it to them. So if I go and say, hey, create me a model for this requirement, it's going to go away and use various agents and prompts that are talking to each other to translate this into a requirement on the page. And once I've done that, I can keep iterating on it, either by talking with the AI or talking with my product person. So we'll just give this a second. And in the meantime, I'll just show you, oh, there okay. Guess no time for the meantime. So here it's taken a pretty simplistic view, right? It said, okay, we're going to enter the pickup and return locations. We're going to enter the pickup and return dates. The system's going to present available cars to us. We'll select a car, we'll enter the driver details, proceed to payment. The payment either is successful and the booking confirmation will be issued or it's not. Now I could just generate test cases through this right now, but there's only going to be two possibilities. So what I might want to do, which is a bit more interesting, is I can use our agents to actually start considering the other cases. So I have a bunch of different agents in here and some of them are for very useful things that we all need to test that we don't necessarily all have experience in. So we have an accessibility agent, we have a compliance agent, equivalence classes. They will basically look at your model and consider what could I add to it to take this into account. So if I go and ask it, hey, let's identify some missing scenarios. What could I consider in this model and it might not be that all of them apply, but again, this is a kind of conversation I can have on a live meeting. So as these come back, it's identified a number of these different scenarios. Okay, what happens if the user enters an invalid or non-existent pickup location? The system should validate this and display an appropriate error message. Yep, I probably agree with that. So I can go and hit this and it's gonna go and implement that into my model. And I can go down these different items. Okay, uh, what if the date is in the past? Okay, that's probably reasonable too. I could go and add this in and so on and so forth. So it's looked at my requirement and understood the purpose of it. The AI can actually use these models as a better way for understanding our meaning. So they can act as a more consistent, persistent way of negotiating meaning with an AI. If you ever try to give it, say, user stories and automated tests and just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, it eventually loses the plot. So if we swoop in here, it said, okay, um, did they enter a pickup or return location? Was it valid? No, display an error. And it's giving them the option to essentially retry here. Okay, that seems reasonable to me. And if it was a valid pickup location, then we just continue as normal. Okay, that's reasonable. I can do the same way and say, well, what if we have um, a date unavailability error? That seems reasonable. And so on and so forth. As I keep kind of elaborating on this model, I'll just skip a little bit ahead to which I have from earlier. I can now go and generate the test cases as required. So I can go and hit generate on this model that I have. We'll just ignore that. And these test cases all the way through here can be generated on demand again to meet that same coverage goal. So as we're building out these models, which are unambiguous and we can generate optimal test cases from, we can now do that with an AI assisted way. And we can also have the AI actually help us consider what things should we be testing and maybe what things should we be considering at a product level. Everything I've done here in terms of the model, I can do before the code has even been written. So for example, handling the fact that no cars could be available, that might be something that even my product manager may not have considered. And there's lots of other things that my prompting can do here. But one last thing that I want to show you is if we come uh, here, I might be given a much longer requirement document, right? So here I have one for SBE products, and it's a very long document. It's 15 pages. It's even got images on it describing the purpose, et cetera. And what we can actually do is have a whole set of agents split up this document, understand it, and translate that into a whole series of models. So if I go here and I just hit import more, and we're just going to go and do a document importation. So if you have a, a, an existing legacy or you know big requirement specification, I can go and pull this in and it will take a little bit of time. And it's saying, okay, this is my model plan. These are the ways I'm going to start splitting this up. So it's saying, I'm going to have a product catalog model, which is going to represent the information structure of those products and how that works. I'm going to have an order management model that handles the logic, et cetera, for that. 
for user accounts and so on and so forth. So an AI has considered that document and done the planning of what models do I need to represent all of the different logic that I'm going to create tests for. If I hit next here, it's going to take these models that it has decided it wants to build, and it's going to build these models. And I can go and access any of them. We can just go, say, click on this auto-generated model. It will load in in a second. And this is the model that represents that. We'll come back to it in a minute. But I can also go and consider this at a higher level. What does this overall process look like? How do these models influence each other? How do they flow together? So if we give it a second, it will figure that out as well. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip ahead to that. So here, that entire requirement document has broken down to, we start, we start with our user account management. And there's a whole model inside here. And you'll notice it hasn't just built this model. It's also documented it for me. So, hey, we're managing the user accounts, including customer, employee, et cetera. So here you bring, begin registration, proceed the input details, the employee selected or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for this end-to-end -end model that I already have here, again, I can go and just hit generate tests on it. Now, the final thing that I will say, and I think I'm missing an endpoint, that's okay. The final thing I will say about this is that this can all be done before I actually get started with any of my coding. But if things change, for example, if we do learn later on, there's more behaviors, maybe from observing sessions like Alex is going to tell you more about, we can go and actually alter these models either by talking to the AI, right? Or just moving these arrows. Okay, this is a new rule that I need, et cetera. And if I do that, because we're not directly maintaining these test cases by hand, I can actually go and generate them on demand. And if we go back to where I was before here, when we do generate these different test cases, like these 56 tests that I have here, we can imbue them with the appropriate pieces of automation on the model so that any test case that, for example, goes in and logs in by clicking this button, they can all inherit that. So I'm not maintaining 56 automated tests. I'm maintaining one automated model. When I hit export here, I can get my test cases um, in their actual automated form, and I can actually go and execute those as well. So the end-to-end -end here is starting with a requirement, understanding and refining that into a model that is open to inspection by everybody else so that we can all make sure that we believe we're building the right thing, and then building that in an AI-generated way where it's faster and we can keep refining it and it can propose questions we wouldn't have thought of, and then to actually go and scientifically generate optimal sets of test cases, automated included, and the data to include as well, but also to meet the coverage goals that we need and then refine that whenever we get more information downstream later on. So with that, I'm gonna pause there and uh, I'll give it back to you, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Ben. This is awesome. I mean, if, uh, if we think about how much more efficient and, and faster it is, right, to uh, create and manage tests compared to more traditional uh, approaches. This is, this is crazy. Just the, the going back and forth with the AI there, I, I thought that was really, really cool because it feels like you are, in, you are in control and the AI is basically assisting you to think about additional things that you might not have been able to think before. So yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. And just two last things about that, right, is this overall model plan that is built here where I'm going through security and the search engine workflow, all of this has been designed by different AI agents talking to each other, but you can go and correct it. You can go and talk to it. And when you're having those conversations with those agents that we saw earlier, right? When you were refining what is there in the co-pilot, you can actually, you can talk to it about, you know, hey, please improve this, or it's suggesting things to you as well. You can also just say, hey, compare this to my original requirement. Are there any gaps? And you can ask it questions. Hey, could this be possible? Looking over your whole model as well. Yeah, it's really cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah, talk about uh, taking this to another whole, you know, new level there uh, with AI as your, literally your personal assistant. That's pretty cool. Awesome. All right. So, um, Guys, if you have any questions, I saw some folks ask some questions and I uh, believe we answered them. Uh, but if you have any more questions, feel free to drop them in uh, and we'll uh, have some time 
uh, towards the end to go through them live if they haven't been responded to yet. Awesome. All right. So let me um, share my screen again here. And I believe this is where I should do it. Uh, yep. There we go. Okay. So just to kind of uh, wrap that up, you know, with Ben, so we've just looked at requirements-based testing in a much more efficient way uh, by using modeling and powered and assisted by AI, where the AI is your, you know, your buddy there helping you develop uh, uh, those models in a much more uh, natural way. And then automatically generating tests uh, to uh, that are automated uh, so that you can basically stop uh, having to create and maintain a test by hand, right? So, um, and now the second part, which is all the way to the right side of the software development lifecycle, which is the user-based test coverage. So let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, let me see how I can do that. I believe I've got to stop there. And uh, let me just go for them. Okay, I think you are, you're able to see my screen. So basically, um, what I'm going to show you is essentially uh, everything is going to be related to this cell phone shop uh, demo application, right? So it's basically an e-commerce shop where you have the ability to buy uh, accessories for your phones. Uh, you have the ability to buy phones uh, themselves. And, uh, and then, so I'm just going to click here on a few things. You can select uh, the different um, configurations for, in this case, your iPhone. And then you can add to cart. You can go to the cart, see what's in there. You can remove what you don't want. Yeah, I don't want this guy, right? So all these activities that I'm doing on the screen of this application as a user, um, think about having AI now capturing all of that, right? So I, as a user, was here in this uh uh, web application, e-commerce application, buying a phone. Everything that I did, everything that I clicked, and the way that I did those things, right? By coming from the homepage, selecting a product here, getting to the cart, right? Uh, there are, I don't know, an infinite number of ways to purchase products in an e-commerce site, right? Some people could have gone, you know, to this uh, menu here, um, and then they could have started their, you know, purchasing flow from here. So as users are uh, navigating through the application, uh, if you think about the requirements perspective, the requirement was, you know, essentially describing, you know, how to uh, how to buy or what is the the, the, the workflow to search for a product, um, add the product to the cart, and and check it out, right? Purchase it. There are there were many flows described in the requirements uh, for developers to implement um, that were thought about from from the business right. So from product owners and business analysts, they thought about how those flows should be working for purchasing a product. Well, when you look at how users actually buy products, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you will quickly find that users. Don't do don't do that. Don't follow the, the 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 beaten path, so to speak. Right? They find different ways, or they choose to go different routes to uh, to 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 accomplish what they're trying to do. In this case, buying a phone. And as they do that, they go through different parts of the application in different sequences that, um, in many cases, break the application. And that's what we're trying to do: is making sure that we understand how users are actually doing those workflows in production. And then based on that, make sure that we are not breaking those workflows in our pre-production testing lifecycle. Because if those user flows break, that is guaranteed to be impacting the users, right? And if it impacts the users, if somebody's not being able to buy here, that's revenue loss for the company, frustration on the user uh, that you know may cause them to look for an alternative uh, uh, site and, and do their business, uh, you know, someplace else. So the impact here uh, is really high. Um, and how do we uh, showcase how the users are actually navigating through the application? So this is where we come to the user journey map. Uh, and in case, uh, like people were asking before in the chat, 
um, what is this product that, that we're showing here? This is called TrueTest from Catalan. And in TrueTest, you're able to visualize a user journey map, in this case, representing that simple demo application that I just went through with you. Uh, you can see here, I can zoom in, and uh, I can see here from my homepage, which is the first node here that you see on the page uh, or on, on my screen. From the homepage, uh, users went to the category page, they went to the product page, this line here, and they went to the about page. And then if you are wondering, what are the, uh, the, the thickness of the lines here? Why do you have some thin lines and, and some very thick lines? Well, that's the volume of people that went from this page to that other page and the other page. So you can see the majority of people that go uh, on the homepage of that application naturally go to, you know, you know, buy something. They go to different product categories. Um, some people go directly to one specific product. Uh, maybe they searched on Google and they, and they found a product and they click on that Google link that takes you directly to the product page you're looking for. And then some people went to the about page. It's expected in any expected behavior in any e-commerce site. And then from the, the product category, you have, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a division here. Some people have, or, uh, have added that product to the cart and they have gone to the cart. Other, pro uh, other people have gone to the actual product page and then added that product to the cart. And then from the cart, they went to checkout, providing the information for checking out, providing shipping address, and ultimately paying. And as you can see here, uh, some people waited to go to the thank you page. Other people just you know, dropped out of the workflow right there after they paid. And the cool thing about it is, you know, you can zoom in and out. So if you have a very complex application, you can focus only on the parts that really matter to you. Let's say this is what you're uh, trying to test right now. The, the, the product page is what you're testing. Uh, and you want to know, you know exactly who is coming to that page, where people are going from that page and validate the functionality that maybe has been changed or a new functionality that has been added to the product page. If you want to have a more descriptive uh, um, uh, understanding of the different flows, you can see here on the left-hand side, you have about 10 flows uh, that have been captured um, you know, over a certain period of time. So you can define, hey, in the past day, in the past week, in the past month, right, or the past X many hours, uh, what are the main flows that people are going through in my application? And if you click on each one of these flows, it gets highlighted on the map on the right. So you can literally just focus on the flows that matter. And if you just hover over the, the, the flow, you can see the a natural language description. Hey, for the first flow, <clears throat> well, let's say here the second flow, people have gone to the home page. Selected iPhone 15, added it to the cart, proceeded to checkout, entered email and shipping details, proceeded to payment, selected the payment method, completed the order, and verified the thank you page to see the order number, uh, you know, shipping time frame, and things like that. Um, so you can clearly understand how your users are navigating based on the activities they are performing on the website, um, and then. Um, with that understanding, that's the first realization that people go, oh, that's different from, you know, the way we are actually testing as part of our testing lifecycle, because people were not expected to go directly, just an example, right? People are, we did not expect people to go directly to a product page. We expected them to first search for a product and then add the product they liked uh, to the cart, not going straight to product and then adding to cart. So that, that's, uh, a scenario, right? And then as people do that, um, and as you see it, you're, you're, you very quickly realize that from a testing coverage perspective, uh, you might not have accounted for that specific scenario. And then you can use that to complement your testing strategy that's, that's coming from the requirements, right? Uh, that's the sort of the, the first realization. But, and then as you want to explore further the scenarios, you can see, well, the, the first, uh, user journey here, you know, super high traffic. That's uh, the, the, you know, the top two with the second one uh, here as well. If you want to look at, uh, hey, let, let's just say I'm interested in we're, maybe we're making changes to the checkout process. I want to, uh, I just want to look at the the scenario that have, uh, oops, not checking. 
quickly check. Um, oops, cart. So I just want to look at the uh, the user journeys that have a uh, cart. They're touching in the cart uh, in the cart page, right? Maybe that's what you, what's the the focus of the current sprint that you're in. And that's, those are the tests that, uh, those are the flows that you want to see so that you can determine if you have the right test. If you don't, you want to generate the test for that. If you, uh, in this case, we have already generated these uh, two tests for these two flows, but if I am interested for some reason to uh, also test this last flow here, then I can simply select the ones that I want and I can click on generate tests so that it will automatically generate an automated test. For me to uh, to uh, nope, something popped in my screen here, but for me to actually be able to run that that test and determine if that flow is going to be broken in the next uh, in the next release or not, and uh, if you also have the option to basically see okay, the screen's frozen. All right, now you also have the option to sell or to filter the different user flows based on traffic. So if you just want the high traffic ones, you can do that. Uh, if you want all the flows, uh, or if you just want to see the flows that already have a uh, test generated, uh, and you can also um, basically say, hey, I just want, let's say the top 7% or the top, let's just say top, uh, there we go, the top 17% of the flows uh, as part of my, uh, as part of my, uh, my strategy, right? So you can essentially slice and dice the data however you need to based on your scope for the current release. And then once you determine, you know, these are the, the the things that I want to test in my application, then you can automatically generate tests for those and you can visualize those tests uh, accordingly. So if I go here to this uh, user flow three, we have a test case that has been generated and can be read in you know uh, natural language, where you start by going to the e-commerce site, you select iPhone 15 as a product, and then you you know do all of these different activities as you are uh, selecting the the right characteristics of that iPhone, such as the capacity of the iPhone, you know, 128 gigabytes. You want the blue one, and so on and so forth. You go to checkout, and then. Uh, you enter the delivery details all the way until uh, you go to the thank you page. At the very end, those tests will automatically take a full page screenshot uh, so that you can essentially leverage our uh, visual testing capabilities and make sure that uh, if you are running the tests, you know, again and again and again as part of your release cycle, maybe through CI, CD, you can quickly understand and, and get the, the quickly understand if there is a uh, a regression uh, on that flow um, compared to the previous runs, right? So uh, again, those tests are uh, are sort of self-contained in that perspective. And another thing you might notice is that uh, in this case for selecting the iPhone, choosing the specs and placing the order, there are some steps here that are, that are indented. And the reason we do that is because uh, the, the technology is intelligent enough to say, hey, this is not the only test case. Test case number three is not the only test case that is adding a product to the cart. So let's make sure that we you reuse those steps um, uh, or that we define those steps in a reusable way because many other uh, test cases are going to use those uh, those uh, same steps, right? So from if we think about it from a readability perspective, it's way easier, right, to just look at the, the test this way, right? So we're... We're going, hey, we're selecting the iPhone, we're choosing the specs and placing an order. We, and then we go to checkout, enter the email, continue to shipping, enter delivery details. And if we wanted to know, hey, what are the actual details in this process, uh, then we can, uh, you know, we can have that visible very easily as well. So from that perspective, what we're, uh, what we're doing is essentially making sure that all those user journeys in production uh, are properly tested before you release your new version of the application, and um, and if there is any uh, any issues with those user journeys, obviously the team needs to know so they can fix it at the highest priority. Because if not, 
there's going to be user impact. You know that for a fact. Um, and, uh, and also you can use that information to complement and augment your requirements so that next time you're creating tasks from requirements, in this case, like Ben was showing, next time you're modeling those requirements, you are um, incorporating that information as to how people actually go about exercising those requirements. Okay. And then lastly, what I'll show you is I showed you the sort of, you can think of it as the, the manual version of the task that you can naturally run uh, as you would expect um, through Catalan. But you can also, uh, I also want to show you the automated version of those tasks, right? And that's where um, you can see here, this is a an automated test that has been automatically generated by uh, by true test uh, that essentially goes through that test case number three. It, these are the same steps that you saw over here. Uh, now you're seeing that in scripting uh, format where uh, it always gets generated um, uh, to match the, the manual version, if you will, that you saw. If you remember those reusable steps um, as we have it here, um, I'll show you this enter delivery detail and payment. You can see the, uh, oh, actually I got it over here already. Uh, these are the different steps excuse me, to actually enter all those details, such as the, uh, you know, the, the first name, the last name. Uh, you can see all the, the data inputs are parameterized. So they're all, you know, there are variables that, uh, that can be populated. And you can pull that data from a, a CSV file, right? As you would expect in this case, we're using, you know, a CSV file where all of those different variables are mapped to, uh, to this Excel sheet. Uh, and then we obviously generate an initial data set for you that's synthetic. But in cases where your application depends on backend data and so on, then you can just fill in uh, the, the proper data to uh, run this automated test, right? And lastly, um, if you think about maintenance, right? So, but, and I think I mentioned this in the beginning, uh, as the users change their behavior in the application, now let's say, you know, we have a different node. Um, you know, let's say we have the thank you node here. Let's say we had a, another node somewhere. Uh, as the user now is changing the behavior, true test is identifying that and then what it's doing it's basically automatically regenerating those tests so that you always have a working and operational set of automated tests to run as part of your release cycle so you as um, you know as a, a tester or as an automation engineer do not have to worry about maintaining those automated tests as the application changes that's really the the key is that uh, it self-maintains based on how it sees users navigating the, the application, okay? So that's a very important uh, piece of, of the, the, the approach, which is that self-maintenance uh, that's happening, uh, obviously powered by AI, okay? So um, as I promised, uh, we have, uh, I was going to leave some time for Q&A, but um, if you guys have any questions, I haven't been able to all the, the chat, but uh, if you have any questions, I uh, will start pulling from the chat. I don't know, uh, Ben, if you noticed great. anything there? Yeah, no, there's there a number of questions about integration and, you know, the, the privacy approaches of the AI, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, which, which tools do which as well. I just wanted to know one thing as well, which is like, it's very powerful as well, being able to see like, comparing to what we were testing based on how things are supposed to work, comparing to what things did users kind of go rogue on the side and do. But the other thing is, Alex, when you're showing that um, the probability of these different items, like how many users actually do the different things, that can also be used to inform the testing you do upstream, right? Which things are more critical and more important from a testing perspective, because you know what your users are doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is... Uh, uh... One thing, like understanding how many users go through one path versus another, like you said, informs your testing strategy, right? In terms of prioritization, where should you start? What is the minimum set of tests that you should be doing if you're crunched on time, if you're crunched 
crunch for time, right? So one of the things that uh, um, our customers do as they look at the user journey map is they basically organize, right, these nodes, uh, however it makes more sense to them so they can focus only in the areas that matter to them. So one thing that uh, we've observed is that, hey, this is cool to see everything in the application, but in this sprint, I'm really just focusing on, you know, let's say here, the uh, the checkout to, to populating the, the shipping information uh, and then the actual payment. And based on this, th that's what I care, right? And understanding the volume of people that go through this path versus this other path, you know, going from carts to directly to the shipping address makes a difference, right? If you have a complex system, uh, it does make a difference. So uh, yeah, the, the, that dimension of traffic, right, or volume is certainly something that, uh, you know, we haven't been paying attention to much for, for a long time. Cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's from the questions, oh, there was a question here. Uh, do you recommend, I guess this is for both of us, but do you recommend teams using both the shift left modeling and shift right modeling at the same time? I would say so. If it's me, I, I think so. You want to get started as early as you can, and you definitely want to be able to test based on things that users maybe could do in the future that they aren't today. So that's kind of my argument on the shift left side. And I think on the shift right side, you know, the, the search space can be so huge and thing people can do black swan things and you don't really know, especially when it comes to waiting, exactly what they're going to do. So if you, for example, have an application that's already, you know, live today and you're getting this data from it and you're not using it to test, you're kind of leaving uh, testing on the table. So if you needed to get some regression done quickly, and you needed to kind of use that data, it's valuable both to kind of get some regression done fast with using true test, but it's also valuable to potentially, you know, weight your upstream testing, you know, weight what areas are important to do regression testing on when you're doing that kind of a requirement based testing for say a new alteration to that requirement. Right. I agree with that. I think the, uh, the, the key is really the, um, how complete you want your testing strategy to be, right? So obviously if you are uh, coming from the left with the requirements-based approach, that's absolutely necessary, but there are a lot better ways of doing that, you know, through modeling like we, we saw today. Um, but if you don't keep in mind how users are actually interacting with the application, then you're missing something, right? We, we especially in today's day and age, where it's all about releasing things fast. Uh, we very we see this every day with our customers is that they are they have an amazing testing strategy. They're doing great with their automated uh, testing approaches, but they're still not catching certain things. And it's not that the requirements were were so bad. In many cases, they are modeling those requirements, uh, you know, as Ben showed. But it's just that nobody had that knowledge of how users are actually operating right uh, in your application so making sure that you incorporate both sides of the equation uh, as part of your testing strategy is really something that's going to give you the the best chance to release a quality product and um, you know mm -hmm. that's kind of how we're bringing it all together like the, we're saying hey we're converging quality uh, by following those two approaches from the left and from the right um, if you are interested in, uh, you know, taking a, a closer look at uh, both, you know, Curiosity uh, Test Modeler and uh, and Catalog's True Test, uh, feel free to uh, go into the into our website, uh, and we'll share the, the deck with everyone as well. So you will have the links too. Um, and also, uh, we're offering a, a AI e learning pack uh, that uh, I will launch a survey here with the actual link for you. Um, you can, you know, just, uh, respond to the survey. Uh, there's going to be a link, uh, as part of that. Uh, and, uh, and then you'll get, uh, you'll be able to get the AI learning, uh, e-learning pack too. Okay. And, uh, let's see if we have, uh, we'll look at, we got, oh, quite a few questions. Uh, let me see if we can get one more in here. Uh, Ben, uh, oh. I'll let you pick Alex. I'm just 
answering the CICD one in the chat. So I'll let you pick one and we'll, we'll talk to another one. Uh, if you should have one, because I'm going through, if you have one already. Yeah, go for sure. it. So for, there was a question about, can these be integrated to CICD pipeline? For complex application workflows, would it take too much time? Like how, uh, how long would it take to execute these tests in the pipeline? And both tests, both tools can be kicked off from a pipeline, whether it's the test they create or, you know, the triggering of them, uh, the automated testing. The key thing about both of these approaches is they give you a waiting for which tests you want to do. So you can always generate more tests than you can, you know, execute in a given amount of time. But both of them let you actually control the most important ones. So for example, in the user base side, you can base that on what users are doing the most of. Those are the critical like top 10 tests or however long it will take them to execute based on what you're doing. And then on the curiosity side, on the requirement side, it's based on what are the, you know, the computer generating, what are the minimum tests for the maximum coverage? So if you only have time for 20 tests, it can get you the best possible coverage in that time, but give you a risk factor for what you're missing. So both of them are built to do that. Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great point there. Um, great. Okay, so uh, we have a few more questions here. Uh, Miles, uh, I'll uh, uh, yes, I, I really like that that comment. Uh, you know, a, way, a great way to bridge the gap between dev product and end users. Uh, yes, that that's something we're observing already with our customers is that uh, the this approach is uh, bringing everybody together, right? Because everybody is understanding how the users are navigating, they're being able to compare that to, uh, to you know, how the business envisioned it, how requirements are specified. And then developers, you know, they can also develop better uh, and, then, uh, and then testers obviously can, can test better as we discussed today. So absolutely, uh, we'll get back to everybody else that uh, had questions and we didn't get the time to, to get there, but I want to be respectful of everybody's uh, time here. Thank you uh, for for coming uh, today, and I hope this was uh, 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 giving you some additional things to, to think about as you consider your different testing strategy uh, for your team. Um, and uh, let us know uh, if there's anything else we can help. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, to engage in a conversation uh, if you uh, if you desire. Okay. Well, I wish everybody a great rest of the week, uh, and uh, until the next one. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks a lot, Alex. Oh,